So I think this is the very, very first session of this annual SIOP e meeting. Uh, and as you know, uh, education is not the main focus uh, uh, at the annual meeting, but we decided to have, as always, very few educational sessions. This time they will be all early in the morning. And yeah, it's my great pleasure that Thomas Lernbecher, which, who is very well known, I think, by many of you, accepted to give the very first talk and presentation of this meeting. Um, and he will talk, of course, about his field of expertise, which is treatment of febrile neutropenia. But I think before Thomas starts, I'm happy that our, our president is also here and will give a few introductory words, Carmela. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Milano. I, I'm sorry about the, the weather. We are negotiating an improvement for the next few hours or days. But uh, I, I was looking at the program, which looks really great. And uh, thanks for coming uh, in Milano for this very early session. Uh, there will be more than, uh, I am very glad, because last time in Valencia there were 1,250 people registered. This year there will be 1,500, so more than 20% more. Maybe it's Milano, which is attracting. Maybe the SIOP Europe meeting is improving progressively. Um, more than 300 sessions, more than uh, two, 200 speakers. Uh, uh, this is, I think this is a, a real great uh, meeting for pediatric oncology. Um, I think that uh, I came here because this is the very first session um, not only because uh, I am the president of the society, but also to learn, to listen to Thomas, who is a very good friend of mine, but he's a real expert. And please uh, uh, ask questions. Uh, he is an expert. He is here to answer, not only to show the slides, but this is a very important this interaction with uh, the floor is very important. So welcome again. You are expecting five great days of pediatric oncology. Um, and uh, Thomas, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the nice words, and I wasn't aware that it was the first lecture here, and I wasn't aware about the hour, because, and I wasn't aware about the weather, but I really appreciate that all of you are here, and I will not skip slides, but when, as you said, I mean, I heard the next session will start really in time, so I just go a little bit quicker um, over some of those slides that we have some more time to discuss. The conflicts of interest here, and the first question I, I really wondered um, when we started doing those things is febrile neutropenia an important event in children with cancer? And to make it easy, when we looked at, uh, to AML, for example, you see here um, those children. I mean, whether it's it's independent, whether it's a um, standard or a high risk group, basically all of them experience three. Um, infectious complications um, throughout their treatment. And about 60% in both groups were febrile neutropenia. The other, yet like almost one third, is microbiologically documented infection. So that's easy because this is one of the most intensive treatment modality in our, in, in the pediatric oncology. And um, there was a paper from Münster three years ago and they looked at sarcoma, and it's basically, and this was really surprising for me, that um, also like 60% had at least one febrile um, neutropenic episode. So it's also in sarcoma, it's more in Ewing sarcoma, as you can see here, than in osteosarcoma, but also here in soft tissue sarcoma. And we see also those um, treatment modalities will get more and more um, intensive. So febrile neutropenia is a common complication in pediatric oncology. About 50% uh, of the patients are affected and approximately 20% um, of all hospitalizations in our setting are due to febrile neutropenia. And many of us suffer from this. I mean, we have um, a lack of nurses, for example, in Germany. So we really wonder whether we can keep this kit or send it, I mean, we don't send it somewhere else, we just keep it in, in another ward. So it's really problematic. We have to do, um, um, or all of them are basically hospitalized and receive intravenous antibiotics. 
and um, fibrinolipina can be the first and only, especially in, in, the, in the early stage, sign of life-threatening infection. 25% of them have like a bacteremia, and approximately 5% um, percent of the patients require ICU treatment. Coming to the talk, I will, it's based more or less on those guidelines. We started here in 2012 with this guideline for the management of fever and neutropenia in cancer kits and also in the stem cell transplantation. Updated this 2017 and then 23. And this is a very international group. It's really from North and South America. It's from Australia. And also many people from, um, uh, from Europe are involved. And when you look here, we have also, it's, it's, these are a little bit um, different. Also, the content is different sometimes. Um, the, uh, the European Conference of Infections in Leukemia, it's the EM, EBMT, ERTC, and the Immunocompromised um, Host Society. It's a joint venture of those um, societies. So these are more European-focused. And the question we started with was, are um, pediatric specific guidelines necessary? And just to make it short, yes. If you look, for example, to the, the mask index, which has been used in, in the IDSA guidelines, in the adult guidelines, you have then the risk factors more or less than um, 60 years, which is uh, more appropriate to most or to some of us, I would say. Um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It's not, you know, it's not important for, for our patient population we deal with. So, um, and also when we looked that children differ from adults, we have different cancer diagnoses, we have different treatment protocols. In general, it's more intensive with differences in immunity, immune reconstitution, which is also quicker usually um, compared to adults and also in the comorbidities as um, I showed you here with this um, obstructive pulmonary disease. So we came in 2011, we came up and, and wrote this article time for pediatric fever and neutropenia guidelines, children are not little adults, and then it started that we developed um, these guidelines and they are based on, and this is like an American thing, on really on randomized trials, on meta-analysis of those randomized trials. Um, very obvious is um, when a child comes to the hospital with fever and neutropenia or expected fever and neutropenia, it usually occurs you know, after whatever, five to seven days after um, chemotherapy, then they uh, get a plastic. And then um, what we do in Germany, and I think it's in many other countries, they, we, we instruct the, pa the patient and the parents to measure temperature, then they have um, um, a fever. It's also a little bit um, differently um, defined when you look to the US and I mean, where they use the Fahrenheit and to, um, to uh, Europe. And then they have to come to the hospital. And we do and, um, the immediate clinical evaluation by trained medical staff, whether we can. Um, and then they, after um, doing the, the microbiological assessment, um, they receive broad spectrum antibiotics. I brought here the golden hour with a question mark. I show you why, and then those kids will be daily evaluated and even more often when they um, clinically de de deteriorate. And what we do, we look to these red flags, whether they develop a sepsis, so uh, the blood pressure, the uh, urine production, and so on, because then we might shift our antibiotic therapy and also start other um, kind of supportive therapy. The time to antibiotics, and this is one um, paper from Switzerland, from, Bas uh, from Bern. They, they do a lot with, uh, um, with this question. Do we really have to give within one hour um, um, the, um, the, the antibiotics? And you see here, when you um, look um, separately to those who appear very well. So we know most of the kids fortunately come to the hospital and they do very well. They have some temperature, maybe they have fever, and, um, but otherwise they are doing very well. And you would think in other kids who are not neutropenic, oh, it's a viral disease or it's a viral reactivation. And others are doing worse. This is this black square um, where you see, oh, 
this kid is not doing really fine. Maybe the blood pressure and uh, the recovery time is, is longer. So um, you know there is a difference. And when you look further, once you treat them, those with this black square, they really go and, and, and develop. Um, they have even bacteremia, either bacteremia or a serious medical complication. And this is like here within the first two hours. Um, so a significant um, number of those patients really develop serious medical um, problems. Whereas those who appear well in the <coughs> beginning, they do fine. So what we think is that um, according to those, I mean, there are more results than I showed you here. Um, this golden hour for all patients admitted in stable conditions seems questionable at least, and we um, in our community in Germany, we think a three-hour time frame should be acceptable. Also, I have to say we have this certification in, 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 in Germany, so still we have to stick to this um, golden hour for all of the patients, and we have to prove that they have been treated within this Hour. The evaluation, um, I just um, want to mention two things here. One is considering, I mean, we take the blood cultures from the, from the central venous line, from all lumens of, of the central venous line. And then there's a big question which also comes up in my, my research gaps. Um, consider obtaining peripheral blood cultures concurrent with the central venous line catheter. This is an um, open question, I would say, because we know that at least 10% of those um, of the, uh, the pathogens are only found by the peripheral blood culture. We don't do this usually, and um, because, you know, I mean, we are all oncologists. When you have like a kid with, with leukemia, the Cushing, three years old, and you don't find the um, central, uh, um, peripheral vein, I mean, it's really bothering, and we usually have this broad spectrum antibiotics that covers. Still, I mean, this is an open question. The other thing is that the, um, the chest radiography, which was um, mandatory in many, many institutions, we think it's only in patients with respiratory signs or symptoms, um, but not in all of the other children. Some words to the biomarkers, because we have this ongoing discussion with our intensive care guys, which it's a different setting. They have immunocompetent patients. We have immunocompromised um, uh, um, patient. And it's a long time. I was a fan of this, I have to say. It's um, when we started this, um, we had here, it's monocenter study, 120 episodes. And um, there you see when you look to those with a normal or uncomplicated fibrinotopenia here on the left-hand side, it's always the day one uh, uh, at admission. Day one is here on the right-hand side. When you compare those to uh, these patients who have a gram-negative bacteremia, so you see a highly um, um, significant difference here, and it's not really overlapping either. So we really thought this is the way we have to go. And then we did this in a, in a three-center study, which much more um, um, patient samples. And you see here also, this is um, at admission and um, uncomplicated fibrin neutropenia. This is here gram-negative bacteremia. You still see it's, it's, um, it's significant, which is good. Then you can publish it. But it's so overlapping, so it was really disappointing. And then Bob Phillips did a meta-analysis, and you see here for the IL-6 that it's not useful in the clinical setting. So the thing is that the, the in neutropenic patient fever and the clinical condition, these are the trigger for studying antibiotics. So the biomarker is not of additional value to, uh, to institute um, antibiotics. And also when you look, because that's the other argument, oh, it really um, goes, um, goes down the next day if you are on the right track. The de-escalation, and I will come to this, is according to clinical and microbiological criteria. So the IL-6 and IL-8 procalcitin is not of value regarding the de-escalation. Maybe the CRP, these are um, very old data from Maria Santolaya in Chile, so they see that um, if it's not really properly decreasing um, the CRP, um, then you are, have to think whether something else is going on. But um, 
these are preliminary data, and I think it really depends a little bit on the setting and on your institution. The next question is the choice of initial empiric antibiotic therapy. And it's very, and therefore I put it in red, it's very important to have a look to your institutional microbiological resistant patterns and specific patient factors. For example, I know in, in Italy you have a lot of, um, um, of problems with um, resistance, and um, which we don't face that much in Germany. And also specific patient factor, whether you know whether it's it's um, they have kidney problems and 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 also um, and this is here from the from the ECI guidelines the initial presentation. This is um, the most important how you choose your um, your initial antibiotic therapy. So most of the kids are clinically stable and have a low risk of resistant infection. This is the one group. The other is the science of sepsis or septic shock, as I said, with the red flags. And then this group is getting bigger and bigger, and unfortunately, I have to say, they are clinically stable, but they are colonized or previously infected with resistant gram-negative bacteria. We have now kids here coming like from Ukraine, and so they bring a lot of resistant bacteria, and you face it here in, in, in what do we do with them? And this is also a little bit an open question. We can discuss how far you go with, you know that they have like on a, on a, on a skin swap resistant bacteria, they come in fever and neutropenic, should you really escalate with cholestine and so on? And um, th that's a tricky question. I think this really can be discussed, but let's go step by step here. Um, the first it is clinically stable, low risk of resistant infections. Um, what we um, suggest is, um, and I think this is worldwide, um, therefore it's, it's, a, it's a grade one, a grade A recommendation, and has a pretty good level of evidence. So it's a monotherapy with antipsychotic non carbapenem beta lactam plus beta lactamase inhibitor combination or a fourth generation cephalosporine. And there is a lot of discussion also whether we should go at least in the beginning um, with a combination when we look, and this is just the, the update in, in, in the last um, 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 guidelines, when, when, we, uh, when we look to the outcome of a combination therapy with an amino glycoside or without, so as a monotherapy, there are no differences in outcome, and this um, is even if you stratify to low and high risk patients. And I have to admit what we do in our uh, institution, and it's one fifth of the, uh, like 20% of the, the, the German institution do it. We, we start with a combination therapy, like when, when they come in the night and in the, in the morning, then we decide whether we stop um, the aminoglycoside or not. But overall, if you think when you have the normal setting without a lot of resistant pathogens, um, then one, the data show that there is no difference. But also we have, I mean, I remember one or two patients in the last years which we wouldn't have um, properly treated with um, PIPTAT's monotherapy. Coming to these, um, and these, these um, children with signs of sepsis or septic shock, independently of the risk of resistant um, um, infection, we should really broaden this. We should um, start with a carbapenem, which is a, like um, a reserve antibiotic. We should not use it really in, in those other un uncomplicated patients with or without a second antigram negative agent like an uh, aminoglycoside and with or without a glycopeptide. And in those patients, I think um, we should also consider to add an echinocandin because it could be like a candida um, sepsis. And then, as I said, it's a very tricky um, patient population, this clinically stable colonized or previously infected with resistant um, gram-negative bacteria. And then um, we should adjust the um, empirical treatment like a carbapenem, in carbapenem susceptible, 3 MRGN, 4 MRGN, and cholestine. We never did it um, in our institution because we never had to do it. What we do, we really put 
big note if they come just consider um, if the patient is sick then really go for the um, adjusted antibiotic therapy and um, and this is also, I think, an open question whether you have to adjust it in all of the patients, whether they're stable or not, whether you could wait a little bit and see how the patient is doing. I don't know. I mean, there, there won't be any prospective study, probably. So then we started this initial empiric antibiotic therapy. The question is what comes after. When we have the blood culture positive, which is in a way, it's, it's, then it's easy. We really should adapt the, the antibiotic therapy um, to the pathogen, what we found, and hopefully they did also some um, susceptibility tests. So that's probably the easiest. Um, what is not easy, and there are people now working more in the adult setting, how long do we have to treat those? Usually it's 10 to 14 days, but people wonder whether we really have to do it. So that's, that's another thing we have to, to tackle at, at one point. So whether, and, and if you have a stuff aureus, a complicated stuff aureus, they treat four weeks. And this means four weeks intravenous antibiotics. It's tricky. For de-escalation, what we need basically is a risk stratification. And there are several um, uh, risk stratification. These are older, but I mean, they're just, can basically choose. They are based on the underlying malignancy. You treat like an, or um, you stratify like an, 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 an like a bone you know, um, tumor differently to an AML. Then you also look to the age. I mean, what we saw recently is, um, for example, that the older age, and that's is the clinical experience has you know is associated with more complication. And then you look to the to the um, the febrile neutropenic episode. You look to the um, um, to the uh, how they present, and also you look to the blood count. And according to what you have in hand, whether you do a full blood count even during the night, like you have the monocyte count and so on, you can stratify. And the guidelines just say there's no real um, risk stratification better than the other. Um, but you should adapt it, what you have in hand, what you can do even during the, uh, during the night that you can um, stratify your patient. And then according to this, you can do the de-escalation empirical therapy. And the most really exciting is here, is with these clinically um, stable children, when um, can you stop antibiotic therapy? And um, basically what we um, what we know is in a low-risk patient, we can stop if they, they are doing well. If they are not febrile, then you can discuss whether it's 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, but if the kid is stable and is treated for, let's say, 72 hours, and they're also like a 48 hours to so 72 hours, it, it depends a little bit when, they, when the blood cultures come back. Um, and, and what we say is 72 hours. Um, these children can, in, in those children, you can stop antibiotic therapy irrespective of the blood count, whether you have or you see even signs of hematological recovery or not. So that's what we do, and many people now do, send, stop this antibiotic therapy after three days. The kid is doing fine since whatever, one or two days, no fever, then they can go home, and um, then you can still, um, discuss with or without um, oral antibiotics. We just do it without oral antibiotics, and most of them are really doing fine. The question is more difficult if you look to the high-risk patient, like the AML patients or those patients, um, if you, um, the ALL induction therapy, it's, it's really tricky because they are under steroids. They are um, have like um, neutrophils, but they are not really effective. Whether you send them home, we, we do this, and now we are just analyzing what we are doing, whether they are really coming, often coming back, whether you have different stratification, whether, you know, according to the age, and, and, and. It works, but I don't, I think it does not work in all of the patients. So it's, this, there are a lot of um, people are looking or having a closer look to this population. What I'm trying to say in there, just having this slide here, 
we were really early compared to the adults. Like this is the adult um, um, guideline 2010, the IDSA guideline, and they said in un unexplained fever, it's recommended the initial regimen to be continued until there are clear signs of marrow recovery, and traditionally you have a 500 neutrophils. And that's one year later, we said consider the, the, um, uh, discontinuation of empiric inf um, antibiotics at 72 hours in low-risk patients who have negative blood cultures and who have been afibril for at least 24 hours, irrespective of marrow recovery status. That's what the guidelines now say, and for the low-risk patients, the high-risk patients, you can really, you have to, you can do it, but on a case-to-case -case basis. The real world is a little bit different. This is just what we did, like some, some surveys and point prevalence studies. So 40, over 40% 40 of the centers do not discontinue, anti, uh, discontinue antibiotics prior to hematological recovery. That's how it is. And also the point prevalence study, which was, it's really worth to read it. Um, um, there you see what, it's not according to guidelines, it's usually the dosage and also the de-escalation. This is these, these main problems we face in the treatment um, of our patients. So people do not really de-escalate as fast as they could do. I think now it might get a little bit, um, they are pushed because we don't have beds in the hospital, so they really send them out and home. It's not the right way, but I mean, sometimes you need that. And the de-escalation, the empirical therapy, just to uh, finish this, is um, when they are stable, they have like these pathogens in the history, like in a swab or in, in an infection, so, and they are stable. After one or two days, you really can de-escalate, take out um, the glycopeptide and so on. So it's many, or some, let's say some, some colleagues say, I'll never change a winning team. I, I, I would disagree with this. I would really um, de-escalate as much as possible. And like a glycopeptide for three weeks, it doesn't make sense. So in those you can really, I mean, I think you can safely um, discontinue those aminoglycosides, cholestine, and so on, what you started. Different, it's different, but this is just, I mean, we don't have a lot of data, and this is based on this very, very few data, so when they, come to the hospital, they have a sepsis, so then um, the guidelines, it's a weak recommendation. They say don't change this. I don't know whether it's true or not. We don't have better data right now. Maybe in the next guidelines um, this will change. What if fever persists? I mean, we have a considerable number of patients who are doing fine. They just have fever, and then this was a long time in our hospital. I came in on, on Saturday morning and the nurse come, came. So 72 hours of fever, like four o'clock in the, uh, in, during the night, we have to change the um, antibacterial regimen, which is not necessary. That's what we think. Do not broaden the initial empiric antibacterial regimen based solely on persistent fever who are clinically stable. It's a, strong recommendation. We all agreed on this, which was unusual. I tell you, we were really almost hitting each other because the Americans, they, or especially the US Americans, they have a different perspective, which is not wrong or right, but just we, you have to get together and you learn a lot from each other. And it's a low quality of evidence. It's obvious that in those who are febrile become clinically unstable, you should escalate the initial empiric anti, um, antibacterial regimen according to, you know, the, um, that you really cover those gaps you have. And um, you have to think at least in those who are at high risk, like the AML, relapsed leukemia, allo, um, stem cell tra um, um, transplant recipients, and also subgroups of ALL, whether you should institute an empirical antifungal therapy, even um, if they are on, um, on um, prophylactic antifungals, yes or not. And these are the last slides, um, and then we have, I think, enough time for discussion. Um, the empirical antifungal therapy, just the background, you can, it's the long standard care of patients. I mean, this came end of the 90s. Um, if they are having an ANC 
less than 500 um, for at least 10 days and have persistent fever, three to five days, or recurrent fever despite broad spectrum antibiotics, then you should or you should consider at least um, um, to institute this empirical antifungal therapy. You can regard, uh, you can ha you think about this, it's a targeted prevention in these highest risk patients or you have an um, early treatment of occult infections. And um, this, I mean, all the, now in, in pediatrics, I think this is like the standard, it's caspofungin or liposomal amphotericin B, which both have um, an A1 recommendation. They in large, really clinical, adult clinical trials, they have the same, the similar safety and efficacy, and they are also approved for this indication in um, children and in patients receive mold active antifungal prophylaxis it's um, recommended to switch to a different class of mold active antifungals. And like the caspofungin, which has um, for a long time, one was not really sure whether it's a mold active or not. There was a, um, a prophylactic study from the, uh, from the COG in AML patient and they showed that the, um, the rate of um, invasive aspergillosis significantly dropped down by the caspofungin compared to fluconazole. So to conclude, as fever and neutropenia is a common complication in pediatric oncology, we have established pediatric specific guidelines addressing initial evaluation of fever and neutropenia, the initial antibiotic therapy, which also, and I said again, depends really on local and patient factors. We know about the escalation, and now I think it's our task to really to move on and de-escalate prolonged fibrinodopenia, you should think about empirical antifungal therapy, but there we have still open questions and these are just some of them. So the benefits and downsides of obtaining peripheral blood cultures, that's just an open question. The clinical um, impact of novel serum biomarkers and um, I, uh, Adisha sends me sometimes papers to review and there's a new biomarker and I always ask, what is the additional value what we have in, to, that what we have in hand? I think that's the most important thing. You can have 1,000 new biomarkers, but they don't bring you an additional value. If you have a new one, then um, I'm really happy. For the ongoing management, it's um, what we don't know is really the necessity and timing of repeat, re repeated blood cultures. Everybody, this is another survey you can do. Um, who does um, repeated blood cultures, some do after you know, the first day, second day, third day, or if you switch antibiotics and so on. So this is not clear what, uh, what the additional value of these blood cultures is. Then the, the um, safety um, of providing targeted um, uh, antibacterial therapy only um, or versus this broad spectrum coverage in patients with positive bacterial blood cultures. That's one thing, then the um, safety of stopping empiric antibacterial therapy in those, I mean, it was especially in the COVID time, um, do we, when they had a positive COVID test, or you can say also like a respiratory virus or something else where you say, okay, this is um, a viral reactivation or infection, can we stop in those fibrinotypenic patients after one or two days the antibiotics and then send those kids home. This is not clear. There was a study in Chile by Maria Santolaya who did that and was, was they did fine. Um, but this is like, I think we have to put a little bit more effort um, uh, in this and also then the safety of, and we talked about this, uh, um, stopping uh, empiric antibacterial therapy in this high risk patient like the AML whether you can do it and how we, we can proceed with this. With this, just was very quick, and I thank you, and now I'm open for, I would say, discussion, not questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Thomas, for guiding us through this topic, which is, of course, I think, very, very important, and that you did it on time. <laughs> um, other questions, please come to the microphone, say who you are, where you're from, and pose your question. Uh, Nilgün Kurucu, I am coming from Turkey. 
Uh, I would like to ask, uh, what do you think about antibiotic lock therapy for uh, closed catheter, uh, port catheter infection? Would you consider the, the taurolidin lock as an antibiotic um, lock therapy or not? I mean, this is like there are data on that which have been shown that it's useful, but unfortunately, even I mean, I was. Uh, this was like a PhD defense, and uh, uh, the applicant said, okay, and he showed the data, was, but they didn't do this in their own institution. We don't do it either. The data support it, but I mean, I would, who is doing this antibiotic lock? Okay, so some, but it's the minority, I would say. The data are in, in favor of this, yeah. For protect the port? We try to protect, so we use it. <laughs> mm. No, it's it's true. I mean, and this is another thing. Like when you you can discuss when you say how often do you like take blood cultures end and end. So how often do you really access the central venous line, and who is going to do that? I think that's also a major point. We um, th there are data like if parents, I mean, well instructed parents. It's fine, it's probably better than not instructed young doctors, but um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, Thomas. Uh, Je can you hear okay? Yeah. Jess Morgan from the UK. Um, we know each other. Thomas, you've talked about the kind of harms and perhaps the fact that we don't de escalate enough. Um, could you speak a little more to how we can encourage our colleagues perhaps <laughs> to uh, follow the guidelines and reduce what we do? <laughs> I don't have a good answer on that. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, this is, I, I just was thinking when, when I gave this talk and I was thinking like the, the guidelines are not very well. I mean, that's, that's the next point now. We, we have these new German guidelines. Now next year we want to go back and see how many really following this guideline and this point prevalence stu study was um, pretty much um, uh, poor, <laughs> uh, even stronger. <laughs> now it's it's um, yeah, I mean you're totally right. Um, th th how those guidelines will be really implemented in the hospital we don't know. We think it's. I mean, we, no, we have no idea. Like teaching is one point, and, 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 but to be honest, what I think is sometimes the, the, the major limitation is the head of the department. That's to be really, to say the truth. <laughs> no, it's, it's I mean, um, because they are believers and non-believers. So that's one point, and the other point is I didn't bring it here. Um, your, I like your AUS rule. Um, very much, but this was just too much. I mean, there is some, um, this we were thinking like now in Turin, you can, um, there is a meeting and that is, is a matter of, dis uh, it's worth a matter of discussion. Szymon Skoczeń, Kraków, Poland. Do you have antibiotic therapy team in your hospital who check the orders of the physicians? <laughs> and the second, do you check the level of antibiotics during the therapy? Yeah, it's a, it's, bo both are really good questions. I mean, one, we have a team, this antibiotic stewardship team, and the, the problem in a way is that um, they have limited power to, uh, you know, to push it. So we really fight now what the next steps are, all the, 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 groups which deal with those patients have to write like a standard operating procedure. And then this we can discuss with the literature. And then we can also nail them down and say, look, you are not doing what you wrote in your guidelines. And the second question was, I forgot, sorry. Ah, the levels, yeah, yeah, we, d we do it like with the aminoglycosides and like with the glycopeptides. Yes, we do it. and. We are now also, I mean, there is a, it's a project, hopefully it will be funded, that we have like with the technical university next to us, um, that they do it like, um, like with a point of care thing. That I think that that's a very valid point, yeah. Volkan Azar from Turkey. What do you think about a case who responded well to initial antibiotics, 
but antibiogram showed a resistant bacteria. Shall we change the antibiotics or not? Thank you. Yeah, that's also a good question. I mean, we have this especially in, in when we look to the candida parapsilosis. There, it's, it's clear that the, 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 the lab values, when you look at the parapsilosis, they do not respond um, to uh, candidates that well. But clinically, if they do fine, I'd have to we do it. We just leave it as according to as they do. Usually, yes. May I ask the next question? I was uh, about carbapenem as the first line antibiotics in septicemia. Why is this recommended and why not pipitaz uh, uh, and aminoglycoside plus minus a glucopeptide? Is there strong evidence that we should always give a carbapenem first line, not in a septic shock, in a septicemia? What do you do at your institution, Thomas? I mean, do it, and the question I cannot answer. I have to go back and look it up. I mean, that's, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's broader, and, and yeah, I, I don't, cannot answer that right now. Hello, uh, Peptis van Bell from Stockholm. Uh, my question concerns the low-risk patients. Do you think there is a, an identifiable cohort of patients that could be uh, stratified at the first contact with the healthcare, uh, febrile neutropenic patients that could be uh, from, uh, be sent home and yeah. put on all No, no this is what I just mentioned to, to Jess Morgan. I mean, they have, and I, I agree with this. What, what I think, it's shouldn't depend on the first contact only. I think you should watch them at least whatever, for like four hours. I mean, you, you can think about the time frame, but if you, you have some observation time and then you can send them home with or without antibiotics, this is another question. But they have, it's a nice um, a paper, um, what they wrote. You want to comment on that directly? It's easier for me. It, so in the UK, um, we've actually implemented a guideline where our low-risk children go home at six to eight hours after their first dose of antibiotics. So they, they come in, they have one dose of IV, they're then assessed, and if they're well, they go home at six to eight hours with oral antibiotics at home. Uh, and that's published, so if anyone wants to have the link, you're welcome to have it, because it feels like we're doing something quite different from everyone else. Yeah, but they go home with a with a with a quinolone. Yeah, they go and home. And this is what I'm Cipro. not that in favor of. But I mean, it's a strategy. At least we could think about this whether we can really um, sharpen and and do it a little bit differently. Because I think m many of them, and this is probably your question, do not need any um, antibiotic. And we had the case recently. We had a fib non non fibra neutropenic patient. That's another question, and which can do one other time. It's, no, it's, it's much more complicated at the end. And what do you do with those? And the, I think crucial is the observation time. And then you can think what you do. And we do daily phone call at home. So yeah. we, don't, we don't just say goodbye. <laughs> we ring them every day and we stop when they're AFAB after 24 hours. So it's, it's a very short course for most of ours. OK, I think we have to finish on time. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for being here.